हेलो एवरीवन सो इन टुडे सेशन वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस माइक्रोबायोलॉजी रिकॉल क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम द लेटेस्ट नीट दैट इज नीट पीजी 2022 सो विदाउट वेस्टिंग एनी फर्दर टाइम लेट मी गो अहेड दिस इज फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इन फ्रंट ऑफ यू लेट मी फर्स्ट रीड द क्वेश्चन लुक एट द ऑप्शंस देन वी विल डिस्कस इट सो अ पेशेंट ब्रॉट टू द हॉस्पिटल विद फीवर हेडेक एंड नेक स्टिफनेस सो दीस आर द थ्री कंप्लेंट्स गिवन टू यू इन द क्वेश्चन इन द पेशेंट दैट सीएसएफ टैप shows increased protein decreased glucose and lymphocytosis and along with this the csf tap image is provided to you in the image two images are provided one is the gross gross csf image and one is the microscopic picture right now all the four options are of meningitis so it's a short short case of course it is meningitis the only thing we have to decide what type of meningitis is it is it tubercular meningitis is it aseptic meningitis is it chemical meningitis or is it pyogenic meningitis so what is the answer looking at the symptoms now in the in such questions now you have to you should be have a approach towards the question now what are the clues given in the question you have to pick up the clues first so the three symptoms are the clues the patient have fever headache and neck stiffness neck stiffness is pointing towards typically meningitis although all four options are meningitis but imagine if one of the option may be different or all four options are not meningitis so this clue is pointing you towards the meningitis in all meningitis there is typical neck stiffness and csf tap is given to you so protein is increased and glucose is decreased and the cells are lymphocytes not neutrophil three clues are given in the csf tap along with this two images are given to us right so correct answer here in this question the correct answer here is the tubercular meningitis i will be discussing all type of meningitis everything about meningitis and then we will have a look on the question again in the end you yourself decide um what is the correct answer now look at the image in the image the gross image you can see a test tube here in the test tube it is filled with csf in the csf you can see a web appearance this appearance is cob web appearance you know it is due to the fibrin it is due to the fibrin this cob web is typically given to you so you should pick up that it is a typical cob web appearance and in the microscopic picture you can see what is provided to you here in the microscopic picture you can see elongated organisms so basically these are the bacilli these are bacilli and these are red color first identify the stain what is the stain here it is shown to you it is not gram stain you can see the red color bacilli in a blue necrotic background so this is acid fast stain provided to you this stain is acid fast stain in the acid fast stain you can see typical micro my, mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria which is present in the form of the rods you can see it is present in the form of the rods in a a uh, blue necrotic uh, background so this is the detail about the images which is provided to you in the question now let's talk about meningitis right we know in central nervous system we have brain and spinal cord you can see this is brain this is spinal cord so central nervous system is made up of two things the parenchyma and the meninges parenchyma is the actual component of the brain and the uh, spinal cord which is made up of cells you know so what are the cells which make up the parenchyma here so these are the cells it is made up of neurons neuroglia which are the supporting cells for the neuron microglial cells that is macrophages right so these are the cells which are making the parenchyma of the central nervous system and there are meninges there are three type of meninges the meninges are basically coverings the meninges are the coverings over the central nervous system there are three type of meninges pia meter arachnoid and dura meter so uh, i have drawn a sketch diagram to explain you these three type of meninges can you see here it is the brain and the spinal cord the parenchyma of the central nervous system the innermost meninges which is adhered to the central nervous system is pia meter is pia meter this is the innermost one it is adhered closely with the uh, central nervous system that is brain and spinal cord the second the middle one the middle one is the arachnoid the middle one is the arachnoid and the outermost one is the dura meter the dura meter is just below the skull the skull and the vertebra right so that is there so you should know the sequence the innermost is the pia meter the middle is the arachnoid and the outermost is the dura meter now there is a space between the this these two meninges uh, between the pia meter and the arachnoid this space is known as sub arachnoid space this space is known as sub arachnoid space because it is just below the arachnoid and it is filled with csf it is filled with csf now in any patient if you are suspecting meningitis how you will confirm it 
if the patient typically presents with fever, neck stiffness, so you have a suspicion the patient is having meningitis. But for confirmation, uh, whether it is meningitis, yes or no, and what is the type of meningitis, what diagnostic test you will prefer in your patient. There is no blood test for meningitis, right? So the only diagnostic test is CSF tapping, right? So CSF is collected by lumbar puncture from the subarachnoid space. The CSF is collected and in the CSF, uh, we will see various findings, various features based on which we will decide the type of meningitis. I will be discussing that. So this is the same diagram, the same approach I have told you. You can see the skull bone here. Here, this is the skull bone you can see, right? And here you can see the brain parenchyma. You can see the three meninges from inner to outer. You can see the same three meninges which I have discussed in the sketch diagram. Now, before starting meningitis, this table is going to be master table, right? In this, uh, you can understand first the normal features of normal CSF without meningitis. So, the naked eye appearance of CSF is clear and colorless normally. The pressure is between 60 to 150 mm of water normally. Cells normally CSF have 0 to 4 lymphocytes per microliter. No neutrophil. Mind my words, there is no neutrophil. Even a single neutrophil in the CSF is uh, pathogmatic right it is diagnostic for the meningitis so there is no neutrophil uh, glucose is 50 to 80 milligram per deciliter and protein is 15 to 45 milligram per, per, per deciliter and normal CSF of course it's sterile there is no bacteria inside that so these are the features of the normal CSF if you know them it will be easy for you to understand the three type of meningitis let's start meningitis what is meningitis so meningitis is the inflammation of the meninges, you know, so one of the, these three meninges got inflamed. So usually there is inflammation of the pyometer and arachnoid. Rarely there is inflammation of the durameter also, but inflammation of any of the meninges leads to meningitis. You know, itis, itis and pathology is inflammation, right? Uh, bronchitis, appendicitis, you know, itis. So it is the inflammation of the meninges. Now there are three types of meningitis. Either the two type are acute and one is chronic. Acute can be bacterial known as pyogenic because pus is formed by the bacteria. Acute, another acute is viral also known as lymphocytic and the chronic, the chronic is one bacteria and one fungus can lead to chronic. So acute can be bacterial, acute can be viral, acute can be viral, right? Chronic is due to only two causes one bacteria the name of the bacteria is TB tubercular tuberculous bacteria and one fungus that is cryptococcus right so these are the three type of meningitis, meningitis in front of you now we will see an overview of the three type of meningitis so the first type among these is acute bacterial meningitis uh, name the bacteria which causes acute bacterial meningitis it differs from age to age so different age groups different bacteria are responsible so in neonates the most common cause is streptococcus it's group b streptococcus also known as streptococcus agilishi right from two months onwards till three years it's pneumococci from three year onwards till 20 years it's meningococci and from 20 year onwards again again it's pneumococci so based on the age these are the three most common pyogenic bacteria which leads to meningitis the pyogenic meningitis right the clinical features acute uh, pyogenic meningitis is a medical emergency patient presents to you with fever fever severe headache coma occasional convulsions and typical complaint is stiffness of the neck patient typically have neck stiffness you can see here you can appreciate there is neck stiffness you can appreciate the neck stiffness here now the most important diagnostic feature you have to compare the CSF findings here as compared to normal. So here the CSF become cloudy. The CSF will become here cloudy and purulent. You can see the image. Can you see the appearance of the clear, uh, the appearance of the CSF. Normal CSF is clear colorless like water. But here can you see it's purulent. It's looking like pus. It's purulent, cloudy appearance. So that is the appearance. Compare the pressure. Normal pressure is up to 150, here up to 180, a mild increase in pressure, right? Uh, compare the cell, most important are the cells. So here neutrophils are there, 100 to 10,000 per microliter neutrophils are there. Normal CSF doesn't have neutrophil. Normal CSF have only lymphocyte, no neutrophil, right? So here neutrophils are diagnostic. 
if you compare the glucose it's markedly reduced and if you compare the protein it markedly elevated now what does it mean why these two things are there now here we are suspecting that the bacteria are present the bacteria the pyogenic bacteria is present inside the csf all bacteria have cell wall agree or not agree whether it is a gram positive or gram negative the bacteria have a cell wall and the cell wall made up of protein you know the cell wall have protein inside them so when csf have bacteria inside them so if you measure the overall protein content of the csf it will be elevated because of the bacterial cell wall component you can learn like that and what about the glucose you can consider normal csf contain glucose i have told you the normal values of the glucose that glucose is consumed by the bacteria as nutrition that that the glucose is consumed by the bacteria as nutrition that's why if you measure the glucose level here in case of pyogenic meningitis you will find the glucose is little bit less and protein is elevated so always learn the protein is elevated markedly and glucose is reduced markedly in pyogenic meningitis you have to understand it if you learn it you can forget it right but if you understand the concept reason for both of them now you will never forget it right so this is the reason for them now if you do uh, various uh, gram staining or culture you can find the causative organism here so this is based on these six investigation you can make out the diagnosis it's acute pyogenic bacterial meningitis so this is the first type and if you make the slide you can see all of them are neutrophil can you appreciate appreciate the multi lobated nucleus all these cells all most of them are neutrophil so this is the typical diagnostic picture of bacterial meningitis acute bacterial meningitis let's come on the second one that is viral viral or lymphocytic meningitis there are many viruses which cause it but the most common is enterovirus enterovirus now like bacteria it doesn't differ age to age but the most common virus overall causing meningitis is enterovirus it's a very important mcq right so please mind it so the clinical features are same as that of bacterial meningitis but it is little bit benign and self limiting it is not a emergency right so coming on the diagnosis the same csf findings we will compare so this time we have to compare the viral meningitis with that of normal right so let me compare it you can see the appearance is clear or maybe slightly turbid because virus don't form pus na virus are not purulent they don't form pus but bacteria do form pus the pyogenic bacteria they are forming the pus yes so that's why the bacterial meningitis are frank purulent or cloudy but the viral one are looking like normal only so based on the appearance you cannot decide whether it is normal or whether it is viral right uh, see the pressure normally it's 1 to 150 here it's up to 250 also so pressure is elevated the most important are the cells so here also we have lymphocytes normally also we have lymphocytes it's the number which makes the difference please mind it it's the number which makes it different right which makes the difference so normally we have lymphocytes in csf 0 to 4 but here 10 to 100 lymphocytes are present per microliter so uh, we we do counting of the cells in the csf on a new bas chamber right so this is 10 to 100 here uh, sugar is almost uh, glucose is normal because viruses do not consume glucose as nutrition and protein is mildly elevated not much because viruses don't have cell wall it is elevated but very mildly viruses have capsid it is made up of protein but a little bit elevation is there and it is sterile if you apply gram staining if you apply culture it will be negative right because viruses grow only inside cells virus cannot grow on non living agar plates so that was about the viral meningitis this is the uh, uh, slide you can see this is the smear you can see most of the cells are lymphocytes mononuclear these are lymphocytes most of them mononuclear lymphocytes coming on the last type of meningitis that is chronic meningitis i told you there are two reasons for chronic meningitis one is mycobacterium tuberculosis it is a bacteria causing tb and one is fungus that is cryptococcal meningitis it is the most common cause of meningitis in aids patient in immunocompromised patient again a very very important mcq repeated many times in previous year exams right so that is chronic meningitis the patient have the same symptoms now you have to compare this time uh, the features of the csf as compared to normal so color here here the most important is the 
फॉर्मेशन ऑफ फिब्रिन कॉइगुलम द कॉप बैब रिमेंबर योर क्वेश्चन वन इमेज इज प्रोवाइडेड इन दैट इमेज दिस कॉप बैब इज फॉर्म तो दिस कॉप बैब द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ द कॉप बैब इज डायग्नोस्टिक हियर द कॉप बैब अपियरेंस Uh, CSF pressure is elevated here up to 300. Normally, it's 150. In bacterial, up to 180. In viral, up to 250. And in chronic, it's up to 300. Cells, you have to see here it's zero to four lymphocytes normal. Here also we have lymphocytes, but 100 to 1000. In viral also we were having lymphocytes, but it's 10 to 100. So it's the number which makes the difference. Which makes the difference. Only one meningitis that is bacterial where we have neutrophils. rest other two meningitis have lymphocytes but based on the number we can make the diagnosis right so sugar is reduced here protein is elevated here and if you apply the special stain you can apply the zeal nelson stain or acid fast stain for the tb so this image is provided in our question the given question you can see the rod shaped bacilli the red color rods on a bluish necrotic background and for cryptococcus you can apply indian ink I know. Do you know what is India ink? It is a negative stain. In negative stain, the background is stained, not the organism. So organism stand out, stand out on a dark background. So you can see the capsulated fungus, the Cryptococcus. It is white in color. It is transparent. It is standing out on a black background. So this is Cryptococcus. This is the special stains you can you can um, apply here. Now read the question. this is the same question which from where i have started the session now read the question i i i guarantee every one of you can approach it very clearly so patient have neck stiffness the first clue in the csf tab there is increased protein there is mildly decreased glucose and there is lymphocytosis if there is lymphocytes are there you have to rule out pyogenic meningitis pyogenic cannot lead to lymphocytosis in pyogenic meningitis neutrophils are elevated but yeah still it can be viral it can be tb right now looking at the image we have decided it's cob web appearance and this is acid fast stain showing tubercular meningitis we all know tubercular meningitis is the correct answer now so this is how you have to approach the question now it is not necessary every time this question will be repeated meningitis is a very important topic now one of the three meningitis can come in the form of image based question clinical scenario based question right so your topic should be strong your question should not be strong your topic that topic should be strong so that any new question next time created from that topic you should be able to answer it right so coming to the next question a very important question on this topic many questions are asked every year you can see here a patient is brought to the hospital with complaints of anorexia that is loss of appetite jointus right and right upper quadrant pain so looking at the clinical scenario it is clear that patient have some problem with the liver in the right upper quadrant there is liver so patient have right upper quadrant pain patient have jointus right and patient have loss of appetite uh, the profile the serology profile is provided to you in the question the serology profile read the profile very carefully in the profile hepatitis s antigen hepatitis b s antigen is positive but its antibody is negative but its antibody its antibody is negative antigen is positive antibody is negative for the s s hepatitis s antigen is positive antibody is negative igm hbc antibody is positive but anti hcv these all are about hepatitis b you can notice here it's hepatitis b let me show you let me show you it's they are talking about hepatitis b b b but here they are talking about c so hepatitis c antibodies are negative right so what is the diagnosis the four options are in front of you is it hepatitis c or hepatitis b the first question right and is it acute or is it chronic the second question so you have to decide two things whether it is hepatitis b or c whatever it is whether it is acute or chronic right so the serological markers in hepatitis are ultra super duper important topic theek okay. hai so let me move ahead uh, let me explain you why the correct answer here is acute hepatitis b let me explain you why you have to rule out hepatitis c looking at the profile because all the things are regarding hepatitis b the antigen and antibody both are positive for the b hepatitis b but for hepatitis c it's negative so there is no chance of being hepatitis c the answer has to be from hepatitis b now whether it is acute or chronic let me explain you the topic completely then we will have a look on the question again right 
सो लेट मी एक्सप्लेन यू कैन यू सी दिस डायग्राम दिस डायग्राम इज हिपेटाइटिस बी वायरस दिस इज हिपेटाइटिस बी वायरस देर आर फाइव टाइप ऑफ हिपेटाइटिस हिपेटाइटिस ए बी सी डी ई दिस डायग्राम इज हिपेटाइटिस बी वायरस अमंग ऑल द फाइव हिपेटाइटिस ओनली हिपेटाइटिस बी इज अ डी एन ए वायरस इट इज अ डी एन ए वायरस रेस्ट ऑल हिपेटाइटिस आर आर एन ए वायरस so here we can see the double stranded dna this is the double stranded dna the nucleic acid we can see this is the capsid and we can see this is the envelope so this is the diagram of hepatitis b virus there are three antigens on this virus let me explain you the antigen the first antigen is hepatitis s antigen s here s stands for surface it's the surface antigen s stands for surface the second antigen is e E E stands for envelope. Envelope. Both these uh, antigens are present on the outer side, the surface also, the envelope also. The third antigen is C. Can you see C? The third is C. C is for core. C stands for core. This core is present on the inside. It is present inside. That's why it is known as core. Right. Now imagine a scenario. This virus is entering in human blood vessel. Let me draw human blood vessel. you can see this is a human blood vessel this is the endothelial lining of the blood vessel okay this is the endothelial lining of the blood vessel this virus have entered in the human blood vessel as soon as this virus enters the human blood vessel please understand the two antigens will dissolve and leak in the blood so s will come in the blood and e will also come in the blood but c never comes in the blood it is present inside the virus na it cannot leak out it will not come in the blood so in the blood if you take the blood sample of this patient in a test tube if you take the blood sample you will get viral dna you will get viral dna and the two antigens s and e you will not get c c is core it will not come in the blood it will not leak in the blood now the body will form antibodies against all all the three antigens the body start forming antibody in response to uh, the virus as a immunity as a humoral immunity so against s s antigen anti s antibodies are formed right against e antigen anti e antibodies are formed right and uh, the third antigen is c now against this two antibodies are formed c is not coming in the blood c is not coming in the blood but for this the body form two antibodies one is igm one is igg both of them igm and igg are anti hbc they are against the c antigen so total in short there are four antibodies so we are having two antigens present in the blood and four antibodies present in the blood i am saying again in the blood there are two antigens and four antibodies what are the two antigens can you name them can you name them out of the three only two are coming in the blood which two the hepatitis s antigen and hepatitis e antigen c is not coming these two are the antigens body is forming antibodies against all but again c two antibodies are formed so one is against s one is against e and two are against c one is igm one is igg so in this way we are having six serological markers which are present in the blood so based on the level and presence or absence of these markers we decide uh, whether the person is having acute or chronic hepatitis whether the person is having infection or recovery or immunization we can decide the status we can decide the acute or chronicity we can decide the infectivity whether the person is highly infective or uh, less infective so you have to understand the relevance of all six markers there are two things you have to understand here number one sequence the sequence of their appearance in the blood can you tell me the sequence okay let's start with common sense first antigen will come in the blood or antibody as soon as this virus enters human body it is entering the blood first of course the antigen will leak in the blood and after that the body the immunity will be stimulated uh, it will be induced you must say and it start forming the antibody right so first antigen will come and then antibodies will come so let's talk about antigen the two antigens are coming first s s is coming it is the first antigen which comes in blood it's very important mcq and second then e is coming after s e is coming c is not coming so that is the summary for the antigen now among antibodies what is the sequence what is the sequence among antibodies among antibodies the first antibody to come here is c c in the c it's igm c there are two type of c na so it's c which is coming first after c e is coming then again c is coming can you see c the anti c so it's igg this time it's igg and last is s so that is the summary for the antibodies 
Can you see? Now let me highlight one thing here for you. Let me highlight. The first antigen to come here is S. The antibody for S is last. So both of these are very, very, very important MCQs. So can you tell me the sequence? What is the correct sequence? Okay, let me see. We can add. Okay, we are not. So can you tell me the sequence here of antigen followed by antibody? The antigen S followed by E. Just a second. It's S followed by E. This is the antigen sequence. And what about the antibody? Antibody? Uh, it's C followed by E followed by C followed by S. I have written C two times. The first one is IgM and the second one is IgG. So you have to learn the sequence. The sequence is ultra important in the course of the disease. This is the course. This IgG will remain forever. The IgG, this one is IgG. It will remain in the blood forever once it will come. So, okay. Now, it's time to understand the relevance of each of the marker. The relevance of each of the marker, right? The first marker is hepatitis S antigen. It, it is the first marker. It indicates infection. It is the marker of infection. Hepatitis E antigen is the second one to come. After this, this is coming. It is the marker of infectivity. It is the marker of infectivity. Now, let me explain you in the same diagram. Okay. I will go to the same diagram again. Okay. Just a second. Now, in this diagram, out of these two, S and NTS, the S antigen indicates infection and NTS indicates recovery. They cannot come together. Either you will get S antigen in the blood or you will get S antibody in the blood because infection and recovery cannot occur simultaneously. Either the person is infected or the person is recovered. If the person is still infected, it's hepatitis S antigen. And if the person is already recovered, it NTS antibody, right? So these two, one of these two will be present in the blood. You got my point? Now, let me come on this pair, E, E and NTE, E antigen and its antibody. They indicate infectivity, not infection. It's the infectivity, you know, the tendency to infect other, other individuals. That is infectivity. If E antigen is present, it indicates high infectivity. If it's antibody present, it indicates low infectivity, right? That is the relevance of this pair. And the last thing is IgM and IgG. They decide whether it's acute or chronic. So IgM indicates acute hepatitis and IgG indicates chronic or past infection. So the relevance of each of them is very different. The same thing you can see here in the graph. Can you see this graph? Now many image based question come on this graph. Uh, if you see the, you know, uh, previous year questions, you will find many questions on this graph. Can you see the first marker which is coming in the blood? It's hepatitis S antigen followed by E. Right. After that, this is IgM, NTC. After that, it is HBE, uh, anti-HBE. After that, it's IgG, IgG which will remain in the blood forever. And after that, it anti-HBS, that is at the time of the recovery. You can see when S antigen is going, then its antibody is coming. So everything is crystal clear in the graph. You don't have to learn this graph, you have to understand it. Now you can imagine how many questions can be created on this graph. The examiner can ask you the labeling of any of this curve. And multiple questions, beautiful questions can be created on this graph. But you should have the concept behind it, right? So this is the thing. Now, now let me tell you the summary. This is the summary, right? I have told you either S antigen or S antibody, one of them will be present. They cannot both together present. I have told you either E antigen or E antibody will be present. Both of them cannot present together. Either the person have high infectivity or the person will have low infectivity, right? And from anti-HBC, either it will be IgM or IgG, right? Now, if now there are six patients in front of you, six reports in front of you, you have to make the diagnosis based on the report, based on the serological markers, the six markers, right? Now, if HBS antigen is positive, its antibody is negative, of course, the patient have infection. Of course, the patient have infection. Now, looking at E, its antigen is positive, so it's high infectivity, not low infectivity. And it's IgM, so of course it's acute, not chronic. So my final diagnosis based on this profile is acute hepatitis B infection with high infectivity. With high infectivity. The same can be due to low infectivity. The only thing reverse here is the, uh, instead of E antigen, it's E antibody, right? Now, instead of IgM, if it's IgG, now it will become chronic. So you have to understand the relevance of each of the marker. Based on that, you can decide the final diagnosis. The final diagnosis. So now have a look on your question. This is the same question. 
and you yourself decide what is the correct answer. What is the correct answer? In the question, H antigen is present, its antibody is absent. Antigen present, antibody absent. So patient have infection, infection is present, recovery is not there. Recovery is not there, right? And it's IgM, not IgG. From anti-HBC, it's IgM. So of course, it's acute, it's not chronic. So it's acute hepatitis B. The correct answer is acute hepatitis B. It's not hepatitis C. Anti-HCV is uh, 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 it's negative. It's not hepatitis C. So it's hepatitis B, of course. So you got it. I guess you got it. So in this way, we can approach the question. The approach of the question is important. The question is not important. The approach towards the question is important. And my advice to all of you, whatever questions are there, you have to understand that topic completely. The topics are repeated in your exam. The questions are not repeated. Now, every educator advise you to do the PYQs of at least two years, three years before appearing in your exam. So I will also advise you the same thing. At least do previous year questions of at least three years before appearing in your exams. But but please understand that topics completely not don't mug up the questions the same questions are not going to come up as it is but the topic will be repeated right so that is the only advice i hope you have enjoyed the lecture thank you bye bye all the best